Hi, welcome to our first online demonstration involving the electrostatic force. So behind me, I have a setup consisting of two balloons that are of equal mass and approximately equal volume. I did my best to blow them up, so they were. They're connected to strings that are approximately the same length. Up here is a metal rod. That metal rod serves the purpose of allowing me to move the balloons towards each other and away from each other, okay? Then here I have a ruler. We're not going to be using the ruler to make measurements. What it's actually doing is keeping the balloons from moving towards the neutral backdrop after I charge the balloons up. And now that's weird, a charged object being attracted to a neutral object, but from a previous lesson, you should be able to explain that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge both of the balloons up. I want to get approximately an equal charge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rub them an equal amount of time or approximately equal number of times. Of course, it is a bit hand wavy to say they get the same amount of charge. And I'm going to step away. Now, when they come to rest, what we're going to notice is the strings themselves remain more or less vertical. Well, that's because while there is an electrostatic force between the two, since they both now have a charge, the distance is so large, given the inverse square relationship that electrostatic force depends upon, that it's, it's almost, it's minimal enough to keep the string approximately vertical. Of course, if it was pushing more this way, we would see that string start to move, move, move as the X direction of tension balances out that electrostatic force. So now what I'll do is I'll move them closer to each other and let's see if we can observe the electrostatic force repelling the two or attracting the two. Okay, so I have the two strings pretty much at the same point at top. And now what we see is the two balloons are in fact repelling each other, which informs us that they must have the same charge. Okay, so they have the same charge, they're repelling each other. Now, if we look at the strings here, they're no longer vertical. They have a bit of an angle to them, right? Well, that's because the electrostatic force, which is repelling the balloon that way, must be equal to the X component of tension because they're in a state of equilibrium, right? The net force on this balloon at this current moment is approximately zero. Now, you may not be able to see it so well in the video, but if we were to draw a vertical line here, we would find that the angle between the left balloon's string and the vertical and the right balloon string and the vertical is equal, right? And what we're going to do is when we move into the actual lesson, we're going to start to explain why that is. But just to kind of start to get at it, well, we know the balloons are equal, right? Equal in mass. Well, that means that the force of gravity is the same. We know they're both being repelled by the electrostatic force, and we know that the force on this balloon is a action-reaction pair with the force on this balloon. And so we can start to see, given the similarities in mass, or the, same, the sameness in mass, and the electrostatic force being the same, that that angle must be the same. But again, we're gonna really mathematically prove that during the lesson itself. Now, what I wanna do next is I'm gonna separate these two things. I'm going to charge this one back up about to where it was before. But this one here, I'm gonna give an even bigger charge by rubbing it for even longer on my sweater. Okay. Now, what I wanna do is I'm gonna move these balloons towards each other again. I wanna see how that angle changes. So let's move this one, move this one. Ah, and there you can see that the angle itself has changed. It's gotten bigger. Well, let's think about that. The electrostatic force on both of them is greater, right? Well, if the electrostatic force, which is in the X direction is greater, the tension in the X needs to be greater, which means that this angle needs to become larger. So that makes a lot of sense. But here's what's interesting. If we draw a vertical here, again, it's hard for you to see and they're kind of turning, which makes it look deceiving the angle between the string and the vertical is the same for both balloons, which may come as a surprise since this one has more charge than that one. But if we think about the fact that it's an action-reaction pair and that the equation is kqq over r squared for the electrostatic force that is, well then the force on this one is kqq over r squared. This one's kqq over r squared. Well, those forces are the same. The masses are the same and therefore the angle has to be the same. Okay, so uh, let's move into the actual lesson. And in the lesson, what we're gonna do is we are going to determine what the actual electrostatic force on that balloon is, assuming that we know the mass of the balloon and the angle that it makes when it's interacting with the other balloon.
bless him. <laughs> um, so I want to start just by reviewing some things. First of all, uh, we started in class with charging and we discussed charging quite a bit. For those of you who were uncertain, I posted those PowerPoints on Classroom which have really nice visuals. I'll also, I'll repost these actually along with this so you have access to it. Then we started talking about the electrostatic force and we went into a little bit of detail with the equation, but we really didn't get much past that. So based off of the, uh, the demonstration, I wanna talk about this aim here, which is how do we find the electrostatic force on the balloons? And here's a, a rough drawing of the setup that we had. We have balloon one, which I'm calling M1 and Q1, and then here's two M2 and Q2. What we saw is as you think these things had a charge, the ropes made an angle of theta with the vertical. And what I told you was that theta one equals theta two. So the angles were equal to each other with respect to this vertical line. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to try to find that electrostatic force given that we know M1, M2, theta one and theta two. And let's even say that we have this length L2 and L1. So we'll also say that we know L1 and L2. I even told you that these two were equal, right? And that these two were equal. And I made you, um, I told you based off of what I could see, unfortunately I didn't have a protractor to show it, that theta one equals theta two. So now let's explore how we can actually find that electrostatic force. So. First thing we're going to do, just like any other force problem, we're going to draw a free body diagram. Okay, I'm just going to choose a charge and I'm going to make my choice uh, Q1. So let's say here is charge one. We know that there are a couple of forces acting on Q1. The first most obvious one is going to be F1G pointing down. We also have the force of tension because this string is pointing this way, and I'll call that T1. Now, repelling this balloon one away from two is this horizontal force that we can't see, but we know must be present, which is going to be the electrostatic force on one. Right? These are all vectors, so let me go ahead and add my vector notation at the top. Now, just like always, let's write our net force equations. Well, we have a net force in the x direction, and we have a net force in the y direction. Right? Well, we forgot to define positive, so I'll go ahead and define these two directions to be our positive directions. And so we can see in the x direction, positive, we have let me break out a colored marker one moment. We have T1x, right? And so I can draw this as, or write my equation as, the net force in the x direction is T1x minus F1e. I'm getting rid of the vector signs because I'm considering it in the sign right here and that's going to be equal to zero because it's not accelerating in the x direction. In the y direction, I have the y component of the tension, T1y. And so I can say that this net force equation will be T1y minus F1g, again, getting rid of the vector because I'm using the negative, equals zero. I can solve these out a little bit, and what I can find here is that, sorry, this is not F1x, this is F1e. Well, F1e is equal to T1x, and well, what is T1x? We know theta here, right? And that's with the, ver uh, with the vertical, so that's actually theta right there. And so if I take a look, I need to use for the x, the sine function, so t1 sine of theta one. Here, I'm gonna have that my fg, which I can rewrite as m1g, is equal to this here, I'm putting over here, 
that will be t1 and this time we'll use cosine right cosine of theta 1 all right now take a look at this we are looking for this value here we don't know t1 but we have it in both equations we have t1 here and we have t1 here so let's go ahead and solve here for t1 equals m1g over cosine theta I can then plug this t1 into this t1 and get that my f1e is equal to m1g sine theta1 over cosine theta1. We should all recognize that as tangent. And so we have m1g tangent of theta1. Well, look back. We assume that we know mass 1 and we measured theta 1. So in fact, we actually didn't even need those lengths, right? Although it is important that they're the same length. Okay. So there we've managed to come up with an equation for the electrostatic force between these two balloons. So what if we set this thing, same thing up again, right? So that's going to be my ceiling. I'm going to attach them at some point here. And I'm going to say that the balloons are going to end up being on the same line. And I look at what happens and I see m1 here at some angle theta1. And I observe m2 like this. Well, clearly something must be different in this situation because, well, if I look at it, I know that there's some electrostatic force on one, and there's some electrostatic force on two. And Newton's third law still tells me that it must be true that the net force on one, excuse me, not the net force, the electrostatic force on one is equal to the negative of the electrostatic force on two. So those two forces must be the same. I don't know anything about the two Qs. They could be different. They could have been different in the original problem too. Well, what's the only possible explanation for this? Well, it's that M2 must now be greater than M1 because the tension in the on 2 in the x direction must be equal to the tension on 1 in the x direction because F1e, which is the x component, is equal to each other. The net force in the x is 0 for both of them, so this must be true. Well, if the x component is the same, but this angle is smaller for 2 than it is for 1, that means that the y component has to be much greater, right? And so I can say that uh, because theta 2 is less than theta 1, right, and these two are the same, the tension in the on 2 in the y must be greater than the tension on 1 in the y in order to make that angle get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so uh, there we have it. Here is the, the, the question that we addressed using the demonstration, and this is just a, a good example of how we can use the electrostatic force. All right, now that we're having this discussion about the electrostatic force and looking at things that are slightly more complex, I'd like to transition to an extension of it. And this is something you're familiar with already. We're really just talking about forces stuff. This is superposition. Okay. Don't be intimidated by the word. This is nothing new to you. It's just a new word to describe things that you're already familiar with, but in a new context, which is electrostatics. And when we do superposition, we're really talking about using vector addition. Okay. Now, um, there's more to it than that, but really, when, for our, our purposes, superposition is nothing but really applying vector addition. So suppose that we have an example. Okay. And in this example, we're looking at a horizontal line. And on this horizontal line exists three charges. We have here a charge which I'll call capital Q1. Here I have a charge which I'll call capital Q2. And here I have a charge that I'll call capital Q3. 
And then I'm going to say that Q1 lies a distance of R12 away from 2, and 2 lies a distance of R23 away from 3. Well, suppose that the question is asked to us, um, we're, we're asked to determine the net force, I should say electrostatic force on Q2. Well, just like before, free body diagram, here's Q2. Well, actually, I haven't given you enough information yet because Q1 is going to affect Q2, assuming that they're not neutral, right? But we don't know how because if they're the same charge, it'll be to the right. If they're opposite charges, the force on 2 would be to the left. So I need to give that information to you. Suppose that I tell you that uh, Q1 is positive, Q2 is negative, and Q3 is positive. Well, now I look at positive and negative opposites attract so the force of one on two is going to be to the left and so i'll go ahead and i'll draw this vector here and i'll call that f21 the force on two by one to use the notation that we've been using now notice when we came up with this force we pretended this one didn't even exist it was as if q3 doesn't exist well that's the key to solving problems using superposition problems where there are more than uh, just two charges interacting with each other so now we'll do the same cover up Q1. Opposite, attraction, so therefore we have F on 2 by 3. And our free, body our free body diagram is completed, assuming that only electrostatic forces are acting on the object. Next, we'll go ahead and we'll define a direction to be positive. Set up a net force equation on 2. Well, that's going to be F2, 3 minus F2, 1. This is equal to what's going to come out to be a bit of a mess, right? K Q2 Q3, sorry, I went the lowercase instead of uppercase, R23 squared, just our Coulomb's law, minus K Q2 Q1 over R12 squared. And, and we're done, right? I could give you numbers, but you know that's just plugging into a calculator, really. This is where the physics is over. But there's an important step here that can become very relevant when I give you numbers. Um, and it's important because you can end up making a, an easy mistake on accident. Well, we know Q2 is negative, right? So if I plug a negative value in here and I ignore my absolute value signs, I can end up having an issue, right? Uh, it, that's made clearer over here because if I plug in Q2 as negative, my negative sign goes away because this negative sign means direction, right? This negative sign does not, right? Those are two different things. So we're using our charges, the sign of the charges, to determine the direction. As soon as we determine that direction by doing something like putting the negative sign here from our free diagram, we're done with the negative sign. We can just get rid of them. Okay? Otherwise, you end up double counting negatives and getting the wrong answer. So then we should get a net force here that is consistent with the direction. But what I always recommend is solve this one, get a number, solve this one, get a number, look up here, see which vector should be bigger than the other based off your number here and here. And that can help you guide, guide you to the sign. If F23 is greater than F21, you know you need to get a positive number. And if it's the other way around, you should be getting a negative number because the net force is to the left. Uh, that's all going to come down to your really your, your conceptual understanding of how these charges interact with each other. Now, superposition extends past a one-dimensional problem. And we can actually have two-dimensional problems with superposition. And I'm not going to go into the details because, again, this is all stuff that you're familiar with. Imagine a two-dimensional grid like this. If I put a charge here, Q1. And I tell you Q1 is positive. I put a charge here, Q2, and I tell you Q2 is negative. And I put a charge here, Q3, and I tell you Q3 is positive. Well, suppose now we're interested in, actually no, let's say we're still interested in Q2, my free body diagram. Well, 
opposites attract. So here to the left, I have F to one. Okay. Then this makes things a little bit interesting. Uh, opposites again attract. So I have some sort of a line from here to here. I'm ignoring this one again. And so I need to draw my force kind of like this, F two, three. And now this is really a vector problem. We'll break this one up into its components, right? And set up a net force in the X direction and a net force in the Y direction equation, just like we would always do. But I don't want to spend the time going into that. Great, so uh, I hope that this has all been very clear. I'm going to be posting the next video, which is about the electric field. Um, please watch through that one and do your Albert IO um, homework assignment. Okay, so I hope that everybody is well and I hope that you found this helpful.